Hey, leaders, in this episode of Building a Culture of Collaboration, I'm thrilled to be joined by Chief Ruckus Maker, Danny Bauer, best-selling author and host of the Better Leaders, Better Schools podcast and the School Leadership Series podcast. In this episode, I'm really looking forward to tapping into Danny's wealth of expertise supporting leaders and gather some thoughts regarding how best to create and sustain high-functioning teams in our organizations. So let's get started. Intentional and purposeful focus on building a culture of collaboration is the secret for leaders striving to make a difference. In building a culture of collaboration, Curtis and Lorna Hewson will share simple tips, ideas, and strategies to take your organization's collaborative efforts to the next level. So welcome to episode 15 of Building a Culture of Collaboration. As always, I'm Curtis Hewson, and today, super thrilled to be joined by Danny Bauer. Great to see you here, Danny. Yeah, pleasure's mine, Curtis. Thanks for uh, having me on the show. Well, uh, yeah, I'm super thrilled. And I was telling you uh, off camera here that I first came to know um, you through uh, your book, Mastermind, and then had also engaged in a a uh, workshop that you had run for Corwin authors around different strategies that you had learned of how to get the messages out from your books. And since then, I've I've been following you through your podcasts and thrilled to have you joining mm -hmm. us on Building a Culture of Collaboration. So I know, Danny, you've worn a number of hats as an educator. Can you take a moment just to share with our listeners your, your leadership journey and how you came to be Chief Ruckus Maker. I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. Yeah, I just gave myself the title, so that's an easy one to answer. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, the idea of making a ruckus, you know, that's a, a, a bit of a nod of the cap to somebody who's been a mentor and a big influence in my life, uh, Seth Godin. And he's somebody who talks about marketing. He talks about leadership. Uh, he talks about a lot of different things. Um, he is somebody that's so influential in the online space, right? You could just type in his first name, Seth, and his blog comes up, right? Yeah. So absolutely. that, you know, maybe you've heard of him, but I've read his books. I've taken all his courses, including the Alta MBA, where I was a student and then a coach. And long story short, in terms of Chief Ruckus Maker, he's always talking about go make a ruckus, right? Yeah. And, you know, Austin Kleon is another thought leader and creative guy that I, I really enjoy following his work. He has a beautiful little book called um, Steal Like an Artist. And I so resonate with the idea of making a ruckus. I'm like, all right, let me take that, reswizzle it a bit, put it in the education space and the audience, right? The people that mm -hmm. I serve are ruckus makers. So I like to say that I help ruckus makers do school different if we want to dig into that later that's fine We'd love uh, but you asked a bit you know the bio and so classroom educator for for over a decade uh I, I worked you know local school campuses as assistant principal principal worked at central office serving somewhere between 20 30 schools in terms of the avid program and helping them implement that as an avid coordinator that was in chicago and uh actually while i was an assistant principal I saw a leadership gap, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe you can relate to that, Curtis, or, or your listener. And the thing for me is that um, it wasn't good enough to stay put. And the reality was my school district really didn't provide, at the time, great opportunities for assistant principals to grow their capacity. So I figured I've got two choices. I could throw myself a tremendous pity party, right? full of like Kleenex and oh my God, do I've got it, you know, I got it so bad and everything. Uh, or I could start a podcast. I could talk to ruckus makers like Curtis and learn from your stories of success and failure. Most importantly, take action on at least one idea you teach me. And that way I'd create results in my life by doing my learning in public. What ended up happening is that it changed my life. It opened up many doors and it became my full-time thing. So that's the story, Curtis. Oh, that's awesome. And, you know, I can resonate a little bit with that of when you get an opportunity to speak with people, hear their expertise, their experiences, it's, mm. um, yeah, it's, it's hard that it doesn't have an impression on you and just add a little bit more wisdom, a little bit more understanding through each of those conversations as well. So when... You're thinking about then, Danny, this idea of 
building and sustaining a culture of collaboration, which is what we really try and focus in on this podcast on. Can you describe to us how do you go about doing that in your experience? And then I want to jump into something that you had referenced for us previously around the idea of a dream list with your staff. Oh, oh. yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely could dig into the dream list for sure. Uh, in terms of like building and sustaining these awesome cultures, you know, I'm actually hosting a, a summer event, right? I, I don't, did I tell you that? I don't remember. No, but I, I actually, I was going to ask you about that too. Is that the school leadership, sustainable school leadership summit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there might yeah. be, you know, it might be interesting to explore some of that, but, you know, I think, I think that as a ruckus maker, you reject the premise, right? In education, there's a lot of things that we just sort of accept, mm -hmm. you know, as the way things are done. And what I'm asking educators, ruckus makers to do is put on your critical thinking hat after you've explored, right? And critiqued and really deeply thought about these premises, like, do you accept them? So for example, when we're talking about sustaining and building these thriving cultures, one premise that you know might be out there is that um, you know you have to give everything to education and not have a life, right? Mm -hmm. Especially and you know I, I really think and speak to school leaders, right? So and and to me, um, that doesn't mean you have to be principal, assistant principal. You can be a classroom teacher and be a leader, so you don't need the title. But I, I tend to work with uh, administrators. Um, you know, another premise, first one in, last one out, you know, have you ever been told that or seen it, right? I just, I reject that stuff. You know, when I have studied leadership, when I've studied creating results or building amazing organizations, uh, something that comes clear through my study of this, it's a common thread, we can generalize. If I can create an incredible amount of value in 20 minutes, then why do I need to punch in for eight hours, right? Mm. So I'm not saying that you just need to work for 20 minutes at school, but you just, you start thinking about stuff differently. For example, I won't share her name, but had a client and she said, Danny, I'm a better mom to my students than to my own kids, right? Because mm. she's giving everything. In, in the district, the system, they'll take, take, and take. Unless you build some boundaries, learn how to say no. We can dig into that topic too, if you'd like. Uh, but being able to really respect, you know, what you say is most important, but then showing me based on your actions and your calendar. And so she was able to make a shift. She's there for her kids now. She's not missing, you know, their events and that kind of thing. And mm -hmm. there's a balance, right? You won't be able to attend all of it. But you certainly won't miss all of it either, you know? And so that's one big piece is just ultimately saying, no, the way we're doing it isn't working, right? Mm -hmm. For many of us, and people are leaving the industry or they're burnt out, you know, or having these, uh, you know, these they're breaking, right? Educators are breaking. So if that's true, let's change how we operate within the system. Systems that are created to produce a result that's perfect for that system mm -hmm. so if you don't like the result you're experiencing then you got to start right revising the way the system operates so that's kind of a high level i i threw in a few sort of specific things but mm. yeah let me know if you if there's anything else there you want to jam on well yeah i would love to hear what what you say because really what you're doing is creating that critical thinking bringing that voice so how would you suggest leaders go about gathering that voice because for me to be able to respond as a leader and really build upon the the skills and the talents of everyone in the organization i need to know which premises they feel that they need to either explore more deeply or even push back against how, how do you go about doing that when you've got a diverse team i might even just ask them right like what are all the things that are said and often unsaid within our organization mm -hmm. that just seem to be the rules that we operate by. I want to explore those with you today. And, and I also want to uh, look at them and, and see, like, are they really serving us? Are they really serving 
you know, uh, our students, our community. I, depending on the psychological safety, the trust and relationships you already have built with that team, you know, um, that will prob probably vary the degree of truthfulness and honesty and candor, right, mm -hmm. uh, of the responses that people give. Um, maybe if you can lead as a leader and model some things that like, oh my gosh, I can't believe Curtis said that, right? Yeah. Um, like, I don't know, something like we, we punish you for taking risks here, right? Even though we say we're about innovation, but in actuality, people get written up when they take a risk. So I, that's just an example. I don't know if that's true for, you know, for you, for the yeah. listener. Um, but I think it's important to, to name those. And I think by asking the question, would be a first step. Uh, another thing, you know, I was talking about saying no, and, and, and you mentioned creating boundaries, but there's a, there's a skill, an activity I teach called creating your ruckus maker rules. Um, and that's something, basically, it, it was inspired by somebody, um, uh, Nick uh, Peterson, who wrote a, a very, it's a 31 page book called Bumpers, right? Mm -hmm. And in 31 pages, he was able to change my life now he's using a metaphor like the idea of um bowling like bumpers in the in in the you know uh gutter right yeah. and when you're a kid you start off bowling that way so that you don't throw gutter balls and hit zero pins you know uh but his point is we need rules we need boundaries um so that we can avoid basically our our lowest performance and if you think about your performance just as like a math equation right if you're eliminating consistently your lowest performance per day, per week, per month, quarter, year, then just by math, your overall average of quality of performance is going to increase. So anyways, I, I teach the um, ruckus maker, maker rules, and those become like three to five sort of rules that can um, create boundaries around how you operate. So your yes can be yes and your no can be no. And so the way I wrote mine is there's three things that I commit to, okay? Number one, if it's not a hell yes, then it's a hell no. Meaning if I'm not very excited about what I'm about to get into, like this podcast, right? It's a no. And I teach people if it's a maybe, then it's a no. Because I'm, unless you're like super excited, right? And, and again, I have a ton of agency and ownership. I can do that, you know? So mm. it depends on context. These are just my rules. I'm using them as an example. Uh, my second commitment is to honor my health and relationships each day, right? So that's calling people I care about and you know making sure I spend time with them, uh, unplugging from work so I could be with my wife and my, my pup. Uh, in health, what do I put in my mouth? You know, fitness, working out, this kind of thing. Uh, spiritual health too, right? I'm really into meditation, mindfulness. I'm, I'm, getting certified in that uh third ruckus maker rule for me in terms of what i commit to is uh, i only work with clients that have a bias for action mm -hmm. that's because i believe ideas are great but not the greatest the only thing greater than an idea is action and i don't want to waste people's time or money right and so if they're going to hire me as a coach so that they become even more effective they better be putting into practice what we talk about otherwise don't waste both of our time, right? And don't write me a check. So like, bye-bye, <laughs> see you later. <laughs> um, and so that those are three filters, you know, for me that, that really work and uh, helps me decide, you know, bas basically like all the things that I do. You know, it really, and thank you so much for not just sharing that I idea, but then the, the practical application that you've put in mm. for yourself. I'm really reminded of uh, a notion that, was shared by Patrick Lencioni, that idea of hey. modeling vulnerability and, you know, the leader goes first. And mm -hmm. if you're expecting, you speak of the psychological safety, well, we need vulnerability to do that. But if right. people are not feeling vulnerable, how do we bring that out? And and he talks about, well, you have to model it. You have to go first as a leader. And really, you're exemplifying that tremendously for us, Danny. Well, I Thank you. Thank you, uh, Curtis. And, you know, I think we got we to gotta name stuff that we sort of observe. And it's okay if you name something and you're off too. But, mm -hmm. you know, I, I was talking, I was coaching this assistant superintendent. She just landed her first superintendent job. And, 
you know, what's fun for me is seeing sort of the pipeline of clients that have gone AP principal assistant soup soup. Like that's like a dream, but, uh, so she's, she's inheriting a team, right. Mm -hmm. And she'll figure out what to do with them. Uh, and there's one team member that's got some health issues and some stuff going on, whatever, you know, life's complex. But whenever she brings up um, this person to her other new teammates, because she'll be starting uh, in the fall, um, she just let me know. Like, she always gets this weird vibe from everybody, right? Mm -hmm. Like, hmm, Spidey sense. Spider-Man's my favorite, uh, yeah. you know, uh, superhero. But anyways, so my leadership, Ruckus Maker Spidey sense is going off. And so I just encouraged her next time she has a conversation, right? Curtis, every time I bring up so-and-so, I'm, I'm just getting, I'm sensing a weird vibe here. Am I, am I off? Am I crazy? Right. Or is there really something here to explore? And again, that vulnerability, you know, it's opening the door. Maybe somebody's not going to step through it right away, but you're also sort of showing like, I'm just going to ignore this, like what's going on here. It's a little strange. Yeah. You know, this isn't normally how things work And like, are we going to ignore it? Like educators are pretty nice. They don't want to rock the boat or, you know, do things that cause conflict. And so I'm just saying, name it, be direct in that. And it's, it's okay. Well, and I think that idea of naming it, uh, clarity, right? You're just trying to be really, really clear. Um, yeah. What I think is if you're trying to create that team or that sense of collaboration, if if you don't have clarity or or um, intentionality, it's it's a hard road to go. So Danny, I had a mention and you said we come back to it. I'd love to come back to it now. Share with us when you say a dream list. I was intrigued when you had oh. noted that for us. What does that look like when I'm uh, leading a staff team? What is that? Yeah. We'll be right back to continue this episode. We have all felt like this before when engaging in team meetings, feeling like our time is not being maximized or that this could have just been an email. As a leader, how can we ensure this is not the reality for everyone in the room? Rather than just simply coming together into a shared space, we really need to ensure that whenever we are engaging as a team in meetings, that the time is being utilized to its utmost and that we are truly seeing impact as a result of our conversations. My name is Curtis Hewson, lead learner and co-founder of Jigsaw Learning. In this free on-demand webinar, I'm going to be sharing with you five planning considerations and then five facilitation considerations that you can put into place as a leader to take your team meetings to the next level. Access this webinar and in addition to these 10 considerations, numerous free resources will be shared that you can begin using immediately. I can't wait to have you join me to learn how we can ensure that team meetings are having their optimal impact. And now back to our conversation. Very cool. Happy to talk about that. One more thing on the ruckus maker rules. Yeah, please. Just so you know, people love to respect rules and that's why it's easier to say no. Because then if you say, hey, I have a rule for blah, blah, blah. Like I have a rule to see my kids um, three nights out of the week and two of the nights I'm giving to the school. You know what I mean? So people yeah. respect that a little bit more. All right, dream list. And again, that's that this, clarity, right? That it's yeah, perfectly clear. There's we're not yeah. living in in assumptions or presumptions. Hundred percent, yeah, clarity. And again, people respect those rules. Um, so dream, dream list. Uh, this idea was inspired from uh, Matthew Kelly's Dream Manager. I don't know if have you ever read that one? No, I it's, haven't. You know, it's very similar to like a Lencioni book where it's um sort of a business fable where. Uh, here, Kelly talks about this um, janitorial service company, and essentially, like the, the workers aren't coming to work, right? So, the not so um, generous assumption that the leadership team of the janitorial custodial company says about the workers, well, their job, like it kind of literally stinks, right? And it's not very fun and doesn't pay that well. So, why would anybody want to come? And somebody has the courage to name that, like, hmm, maybe, but I bet it's something else and we need to explore why. So when they dig into why people aren't coming to, to work, uh, the public transportation is not um, consistent and many of the workers don't have their own kind of transportation. This is an issue. 
So all of a sudden, um, they see the problem. They solve it by getting like a fleet of uh, little vans, sprinter vans, and are able to get their people to the job sites. Now people are going. So that's great. Solve that problem. Uh, but then they, you know, then they start to leave. Well, what's going on there? What they, after some exploration, that kind of thing, what they end up finding out is uh, people have hopes, dreams, and aspirations. And as an organization, we don't know what they are. We're not helping our people realize those. And so they're not feeling like seen and heard or valued and they're leaving, right? Hmm. So what if we hire and create a position called the dream manager who would sit with Curtis, find out his hope, dreams, and aspirations, and if possible, help him accomplish those things, right? So in the book, you know, they talk about a lady who had never owned a house. And so they didn't buy her a house but they helped her think through like her, her finances, right? Financial literacy, savings, you know, blah, blah, blah. And over time, she's able to put down a down payment by the house and she's thrilled, right? She starts hosting parties, telling everybody how amazing the company is. And before you know it, they have to turn away workers because this becomes a place where your dreams are fulfilled. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, I bet if ruckus makers would get to know their people at a very deep and personal level, and again, back to reject the premise, right? It's not about, um, you hear separate the personal and professional, right? Yeah. I think if you do that too much, what, what the risk is, is that you become a robot, right? People don't see you as a human, as a normal person with emotions and a family and hopes and dreams, but also fears, you know, and worries and all this Absolutely. kind of stuff. So lean into the humanity, bring in the emotions to work, find out what the hopes, dreams, and aspirations are of your people, and then help them make it possible. So a couple of examples of how I've done this with clients. Um, there was uh, Jess, who is a principal in Chicago. She always wanted to mentor school leaders. Well, guess what? I know a lot, and I mean a lot of school leaders. So we created like an application that was free free coaching and mentorship from a really great veteran principal who's in here's the you know criteria you had to be like first year second you know pretty new to it yeah blah 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 a whole bunch of people filled it out gave just the results she looked through them you know talked to a few of them and and selected uh paya and uh she ended up working with her for over a year uh, Paya eventually joined our leadership community. So it was a win for us. I didn't expect that to happen at all. Mm -hmm. uh, and just, you know, check that off her list. So that's one way. It was super easy. Um, you know, there's another guy who wanted to get back into running. So I, I bought him a, I bought him a Garmin watch, whatever. Like, I know this is something you, you care about. Uh, you should, you should be tracking your miles and steps and getting those runs in. And, you know, he, he had referred a couple people to our leadership community. So I was happy to, I was happy to buy him a gift, right? We, we had the financial runway to do that. So you could be listening, you could help people plan. Um, you could do a financial gift if it makes sense. Uh, but you know, it's really understand people's hopes, dreams, and aspirations. Um, they could be things like buying a house, you know, countries to visit, uh, adventure experiences. I don't know, like all sorts of things. And it's like, do you understand what they are and how might you help them make it a reality. Well, and boy, would that ever have a huge impact too in creating where we were before and that vulnerability, that trust when you can see, you know, we, I or the collective we care so much about you that we're yeah. taking the time to learn. We're trying to help support in in whatever ways we can. And I could even imagine, do you ever then Danny do that as an exercise collectively where it's not just the dream manager or me as a leader knowing those things, but us collectively knowing and yes, understand. Hundred percent, hundred percent. So we we did it within you know our mastermind, um, and then I challenged everybody to do it within their uh, schools. For those that did, you know, one of the big ahas was this: right, there were people who worked with each other for decades, <laughs> decades, that never knew what really drove that person, right? What yeah. was that ultimate hope, dream, or aspiration? And because they did this activity and created a space to share and talk about it, these colleagues who had been together for so long, right? 
got each other for the first time in decades. And the other thing I want to say that's very important here, Curtis, you know, this is a this is a great way to attract and retain quality educators, right? You have two campuses, campus A that runs school and education, business as usual, campus B that does stuff like this, creating a dream list and creating the space and helping people actually achieve it, discuss it, blah, 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 blah. What school are the teachers going to choose? They're going to yeah. choose one where they feel connect that they're doing things, you know? Um, it's just, it's a great way to, to stand out and set yourself apart as a school system as well. Absolutely. And I love the idea of keeping that connection to humanity because my experience has been, especially educators, they're so tightly connected mm -hmm. to who I am as an educator, what I do in the classroom. It's, it's not, I clock out and I leave that here and I go sure. do, do things outside of school. It's, it's a pretty big part of who I am and my identity. You know, it's interesting yeah, with yeah. that, that dream list. We did a version like that with our own team. It was inspired by Ray Dalio's um, creating a, a baseball card for each team member. And, oh, yeah, okay. yeah, similar types of things on it where we could list out, you know, what we had the, you know, what are your aspirations? And then, you know, what are some things that you feel are strengths and what are some areas that are triggers for you? But again, the learning that happened from one another was really, really powerful, mm, which is yeah, so important. That's great stuff. So good. So, hey, tell me, you know, you've been talking about um, the coaching and the support, and I know that's the critical work that you do um, here with educators and leaders across the country and beyond. But can you, I know you, I've heard you talk before about the ripple effect tool that you use in, in some of those conversations. Can oh. you share with our listeners what that, that is? We'll be right back to continue this episode. Feeling overwhelmed with the expectations being placed on teachers, leaders, and educational systems to respond to the diverse needs of our learners? Are you wanting to take your PLCs and RTI efforts to the next level? It definitely takes a highly coordinated framework of structures and processes to maximize the collective capacity of your team to ensure success for all students. Collaborative response is that framework. Order your copy of our bestseller, Collaborative Response, three foundational components that transform how we respond to the needs of learners, which includes access to a comprehensive companion website. Join the thousands of schools using the framework to ensure high levels of success for students and staff. And now back to our conversation. So ripple effect, you know, just think about the stone you throw into the water, right? And you see the ripples come out. Mm -hmm. Now, school leaders want to create results and do great things for kids, and quote unquote, what's best for kids, which I, I don't like that phrase at all. Mm -hmm. And if you want to talk about that, we can. But ripple effect tool. So when we're thinking about results and stuff we want to get done, the play it safe principle, the uh, unenlightened non-ruckus maker principle, right? They're trying to push initiatives through because they have what they think is positional power, you know, and you should do it because I said so, right. or it's what's best for kids. And I'll just, I'll just tell you why I hate that phrase. I'd love to usually... Yeah, usually the school leader who says it, all it means is, in my opinion, this is what's best for kids. We haven't done the hard work to define it as a community. So when I say that, everybody in the crowd of my staff says, yeah, according to you, <laughs> right? Yeah. But, but they, you know, the school leader doesn't hear that. And that's why it's not effective because it's not a commonly defined term, right? So uh, anyways, positional power or getting done what you think is best for kids or whatever, like that might get results in the short term of putting in pressure, you know, pressure and uh, um, write-ups and, you know, all this stuff that you administrators could do. That's one way. Yeah. Here's positional the better power. Way. Yeah. Yeah. Here's the better way. The ripple effect tool has you think about what's the thing you're trying to achieve. And then it's thinking about key players on the team, right? that you know um, 
maybe even have more influence than you as a school leader, right? Like, are you aware that there's people on the faculty, you know, when they speak, more people listen? And yeah, that's cool. super that's great. Right? Yeah, yeah, 100%. So who are those people that exist? Write down their name. Write down what is their strength, right? What are their strengths? Write down, do you know, back to sort of dream list or professional sort of milestones, what are things that matter to them? Not you, not what matters to Curtis or Danny, what matters to that person, right? Mm -hmm. And then go to them and figure out how you're going to help them achieve that thing so that what you want to accomplish, right, they're happy to help. Because there's a beautiful thing called the law of reciprocity. It's just how things work. If I'm generous to you, usually, unless you're a sociopath, you want to help me too, <laughs> right? That's Absolutely. just how it works, you know, unless like maybe you were shaken up a little bit too much as a baby. I don't know. <laughs> but my point is you help them, you help them achieve what they want. It's very similar to dream list, except usually it's focused more on like a professional goal that they have. Um And then you just let them know like what you're trying to do and say you're building a team. And since they're the big influencers, they go out and influence other people and voila, you, you accomplish what you want. So it's just, it's a more slowing it down and really thinking about like, yeah, how am I going to approach this new initiative project goal that I have for the school? You know, I, again, trying to keep connecting this to other learning and that have you ever read a book called The Go Giver by Berg and Mann? I believe are the yeah, because yeah, um, Mann was on my podcast ages oh, ago, long, long yeah. time ago. Yeah, awesome. Well, when I heard you say before that you know you helped this person, and as a result, they introduced someone to your network, which was not the intent of why you did this, but it's that yeah. reciprocity and the idea that they talk about in the book that I love is you do things for others, not to get the return but to understand that by giving uh, giving and giving it's this is different than being a go-getter where i'm trying to get 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 i i want to give freely and it's it's going to come back and i think that's so powerful when we think about creating teams within schools Mm. and collaborative efforts right yeah for sure and um you know when it comes to uh John David Mann there, when I had him on the show, fun fact, just so you know, um, he created his own high, high school as a high school student. He was a part of um, he was a part of some little group of kids somewhere in New England. Oh, no and way. they helped uh, they helped create their own school. What you're talking about, too, is like the give to give philosophy. Right. And uh, yeah. the idea of, you know, what's the quote? Try not to become a man of, of success but rather a, a man of value, right? Have you ever heard that one before? Yeah, Einstein? absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I love that. So we're uh, we're coming up on a little bit of time here, Danny. We have a question we always love asking people that come on the show, and it's this. And then I do want to move to how people can get in touch and a little bit more about the Sustainable School Leadership Summit. So the question that I want to pose out to you is if you knew then, or in the spirit of if you knew then what you know now, what advice would you give your past self in relation to establishing and sustaining high impact collaborative cultures? Hmm. You know, high impact collaborative cultures, partly what I would tell a, a younger version of myself is to have the humility to realize like your way is not the only way. Yeah, You know, as I've um, aged and as I've, thank God, traveled the world, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I I don't know if this is true in every culture. In American culture, um, we can really think that our way is the only way and the best way, you know? That seems probably maybe like a human thing, but I could be wrong. But tra- traveling the world and just, you know, living in, di- I've lived in five different countries, right? In five different states down in the U.S. Um, I realized, wow, there's a lot of different ways we can solve problems or do life or do school. Mm-hmm. And so this isn't the only solution. And and that 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 requires humility. You know what I mean? Uh, and so that's what I would tell myself 100%. 
Yeah, I love that. That's a great reminder for for everyone of as as we grow and and inevitably age that that yeah. becomes critically important for us. So I want to wrap back around because I did see it mm. on uh, some of your socials here lately, uh, Danny, the Sustainable School Leadership Summit. Can you share with our listeners what that is and why they should definitely be getting involved? Yeah, if you can, we'd love to have you. It's July 12th through the 14th down in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, I will promise you like our Ruckus Maker events are different than anything else you'll experience in education. We will cover a few small amount of topics and go super duper deep. Uh, we'll provide tools and, and templates so you can apply the ideas that we teach. And unlike other conferences, um, we also uh, embed an abundance of time to do what we usually do in the mastermind, which is live masterminding and running hot seats where you solve your biggest challenge. But you also can network with peers or have time on your own, again, to implement ideas or just learn from others, right? How do other leaders think? Uh, how do they approach, you know, the same challenges you have and so on and so forth. So it, it'll be a couple of days of um, training and then we'll have a half day where we just go do some fun stuff. And usually I don't, um, you know, reveal what the fun adventure type thing is. You just say if you're, if you're in for that or not, but again, different than your, your typical education conference. It will, will help you establish your sustainable school leadership point of view, uh, figure out like how to attract uh, interview, onboard, mentor, and retain top talent. Um, get those initiatives like the Ripple Effect tool, like get your those initiatives, uh, uh, you know, implemented within your campus and a bunch of other stuff. So, um, yeah, happy happy to have you. If that's something that would serve you for sure, I think I think we have about like eighteen tickets left. We're we're going for about fifty people. We don't like it too too big. So, um, yeah, it's it's been filling up, which is great. Awesome. Well, we'll make sure that we add it to uh, the show notes. And Thank this uh, this show's scheduled to come out in May. So if those spots are filled already, hopefully mm -hmm. it'll create awareness for future events as well. And even more so, Danny, tell us how can listeners get in touch with you and and uh, the work that you do? What's the best way to to do that? For sure. And actually, one question. Do you find that most of your audience is uh, in Canada or, or the States or... It's starting to branch according to some of our statistics. The work that I engage with okay. is primarily Canadian at this point, but I do know yep. that uh, listeners are popping up in, in a lot of countries now. Fantastic. The only reason I, I bring that into the conversation is that I realize, um, you know, what, what principals and administrators get paid around the world is is different. So mm -hmm. uh, to, to attend the event, um, if you're from outside the US, I'm happy to work with you to make it make it work for your budget too. Awesome. So uh, we do that in the mastermind as well, right? With our Canadian and um, other international members. So happy to be flexible on that. That's um, but it, yeah, fantastic. So in terms of contacting me, you could send me an email, danny at betterleadersbetterschools.com. Um, I'm pretty good about like not checking email too frequently. Uh, so the, the best way, you know, find me Facebook, LinkedIn, I'm very active there. Um, and then you can call or text. So my number is plus one, three, one, two, seven, eight, eight, seven, five, nine, five. So that works really well for us and Canada. Uh, that's also my WhatsApp number two, if you're outside of those two places. All right. Well, I want to uh, say thank you so much, Danny. This has been an absolute <laughs> pleasure and I've been thank looking you, forward to it to chatting with you. I do know you had shared with me that you have a vacation upcoming. So I wish you all the rest and relaxation during that time as well, my friend. I'm off to Morocco. We have a three day excursion through the desert. If you never hear from me again, <laughs> I found the meaning to life out there and uh, I gave up, I gave up on the rest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks so much, Danny. Wish you all the best and we'll be in touch. Pleasure. Thank you. Wow, I have been looking forward to that conversation with Danny uh, for quite some time now, having uh, followed him through different mechanisms and his, his podcast as well. And just want to come back to some of the key learnings that came through in that conversation. You know, it's it's been shared in numerous uh, episodes of these podcasts, and I'm a big believer in it as well. But that 
idea of vulnerability just keeps coming up over and over and over again when it comes to creating cultures of collaboration that when we want really high impact collaboration strong teams the vulnerability is so important and Danny definitely alluded to that within within the conversation and the idea of modeling that as a leader is so critically important I really also love that idea of creating commonly defined terms, things that uh, we'll define together as a team and, and make that clear, I think is, is important for us. And if there's a takeaway for anyone within this, I love that idea of the, the dream manager, but really the essence of, do you know your team and do your team know one another? And that includes the hopes and dreams and aspirations that we have that when we can help one another to achieve those things that we are striving for not just per not just professionally but personally as well man that creates some tighter connections and you know creates that organization that that, that I want to be a part of and others want to be a part of as well so thanks so much for Danny for joining we'll make sure to put uh, some of the items that he uh, mentioned or discussed, including the Sustainable School Leadership Summit, into the show notes. We'd really ask that you share this uh, podcast episode out with a friend if you found value in it. Subscribe and really look forward to uh, next conversations that we have. Make sure to check out uh, Danny. He uh, is frequently putting out podcast episodes and uh, postings up in social media as well so lots of learning that can be done through through Danny so with that I wish you all the best as you continue to build and sustain cultures of collaboration take care and I wish you all the best <laughs>